up here in case anybody else wants to uh, come on up here and sing. And nothing is working. Okay, and we have Dick over here on the piano helping us out this morning uh, because Dave is sick. So we're going to uh, say a prayer for Dave later on. And I am going to do the best that I can to worship God this morning. So we're going to start with, I believe in Jesus. Dick, that's different than what I told you earlier. So you can find, I believe in Jesus. conference so we want to invite you back next Sunday evening at 5 30 uh, we're going to meet together for our missions conference here for missionaries both the, some of them are far away some that are local we're going to have a representative from New Hope here hear about some of the missions projects that you've been supporting uh, so we want to invite everybody back next Sunday evening for our annual missions conference men October 2nd it's a Saturday morning at 8 30 we're going to have a men's breakfast uh, so we want to invite you for that men's breakfast October 2nd Saturday morning at 8 30 there are also two prop walks going on in our area. One is coming up October 3rd. That's a Sunday. That's the Kirkville prop walk. So if you want to walk in that one, that's coming up the 3rd. And then October 17th is the Chittenango prop walk. So a lot of information about the prop walks out in the hallway. You can take a look at that. We have a clothing giving giveaway this uh, Friday and Saturday, the 24th and 25th. So if you need clothes, we're going to have a clothing shed all outside, weather permitting. Uh, if you need clothing or you want to bring someone or let someone know, we'll be giving a clothing giving away this Friday and Saturday from 10 to 2. Choir practice starts tomorrow evening. It is not too late if you want to be a part of the choir. That's going to start up tomorrow evening, the practices for that. And two things that we've been talking about that unfortunately both were canceled. The Mars Hill concert uh, due to COVID, uh, they're canceling that concert. Uh, so that concert is canceled. If you need a refund, uh, they'll be contacting you. And also the community Thanksgiving service. Uh, that we were often a part of at the Catholic Church in Chittenango, they have canceled that as well. So those two events, uh, community events, have been canceled. We do have announcements from Gordy. Uh, Gordy, want to come up and share something that has, he has on his heart? Gordy. Working. 
Good morning, guys. It's an awesome day to be in the house of the Lord. It's a privilege to be up here to speak to you guys. Start off with a little joke to kind of get us ready. I heard about this man. He was taking a walk in the woods with his friend. When suddenly they encounter a huge grizzly bear about 20 yards in front of them. They both froze in their tracks. As the bear intently stared them down, they contemplated what they should do. Finally, the man said to his friend, I think we should run. His friend said, are you crazy? You can't outrun a grizzly bear. The man said, I know that. I don't have to outrun him. I just have to outrun you. <laughs> so I want to talk about serving today. Studies have shown that volunteering is so good for the mind and body that it can ease symptoms of stress and depression. Tapping into our gifts and passions builds self-confidence, energy, and strength. Serving others can also be the best distraction from our own worries. To be part of the body of Christ is to have found hope and salvation in Jesus. It is an honor to receive the gift of salvation, which we cannot earn ourselves, but that was freely given to us when Jesus died on the cross for the world. This term, body of Christ, helps us understand what it means to be part of the church. Jesus is the head of the church, and we as believers make up the church, and therefore are deeply connected to the work and mission of Jesus. Every believer has been given certain spiritual gifts and skills to contribute to the church and is valuable and important to furthering God's kingdom. You know, each week as Pastor Eric speaks the word of God, I find it interesting that almost every week there is scripture in his message that refers to serving. I think it's pretty obvious that either Pastor really wants people to serve or scripture shows us how important it is to serve. Both are good reasons to serve in the church, but here is just a few pieces of many scripture that speaks of serving. For as one, in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. It's Romans 12, 4, and 5. There is one body and one spirit. Just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all in all. But grace was given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. It's Ephesians 4.12. Finally, Mark 10.45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. When the church or the body of Christ works together and is joined together in faith, we can function properly in the role that Jesus has given to the church. When there is disharmony in the church, it will be difficult to fulfill its mission. From whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint, which, with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow, so that it builds itself up in love. Ephesians 4.12 or 4.16. And Jesus is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. We all make all kinds of rational explanations for not serving. I don't have time. I don't know what I would do. I don't have any special skills to contribute. They don't need me. But the reality is, the Lord doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. God used men and women with similar doubts to change the course of history. Moses didn't think he was a leader or speaker, but God worked through Moses to bring Israel out of slavery. David was the youngest and therefore most insignificant of all his brothers, but God worked through David to defeat a giant and eventually made him a king. We are called by the Most High God to serve. He gave the ultimate sacrifice on the cross for us. Work willingly in whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord, rather, for, rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward, and that the master you are serving is Christ. We have many areas here to serve if you are interested. 
There are currently needs for greeters at both doors to welcome people as they come and go to service and to remain at the doors to keep the church secure during service. There are needs for sound and video. We need volunteers to help record and stream video. We have opportunities to serve on the worship team. And we may have opportunities this winter for plowing the church parking lot. We have many places in the church that you can serve. Please see myself, Pastor Eric, or any one of the other church leaders to get involved. We want everyone here involved. As more people are involved, we are a healthier, more united, more beautiful example of what the church is. We are in the house of God. In closing, I thank all here who serve in any form. Your work is for the Lord. And I encourage all of you to not just be bystanders, but to get involved, have fun, and remember we serve an awesome, most high God. Let's start off with a, a word of prayer this morning. Dear the Father, we do thank you this morning. We thank you, Lord, that you call us to go to the church. We thank you for the family of God. We thank you that we are able to go to God in this Lord's day. Father, as we worship you, may we just direct our worship from hearts of love towards you. Father, I pray that you will bless us this morning. Lord, that we may see you, that we may hear your voice, whether it's through singing, through prayer, as we open up your word in a few minutes. Father, that you will bless us up here, maybe with the kids as they go down to Sunday school in a few moments. Father, we just give this time over to you. Direct our hearts towards you. We pray this in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. So as we go through this video series, we've been looking at heroes of the faith. Mm -hmm. And this morning, for the kids' video, we're going to look at another hero of the faith, Joshua. So if you guys want to show that video. Israelite who followed Moses through the wilderness. Joshua learned from Moses as Moses led the Israelites through the Red Sea. And as Moses taught the people about God's law. One day, Moses was talking to the Israelites. He was reminding them of the law and all that God had done for them. When Moses had finished giving instructions to the people, he said, I am no longer able to lead you. Do not be afraid, for God will neither fill you nor abandon you. Then Moses called Joshua and told him to be strong and courageous, for he would lead the Israelites into the promised land. Then Moses died. To this day, no one knows exactly where he was buried. The people and all of Israel mourned. The people of Israel looked to Joshua to lead them, as Moses had told them. God told Joshua to be strong and courageous, for he would be with Joshua wherever he went. He told him to remember what Moses had told him and to study the book of instruction. God told Joshua that it was time to lead the people of Israel across the Jordan River and into the Promised Land. Joshua told the Israelite officials to go throughout the camp. They instructed everyone to pack up and get ready to head out. Joshua told the Israelites they were going to cross the Jordan River. And so, Joshua prepared to lead his people as the Lord had commanded. Well, this time we release the kids. They want to head down to Sunday school. We want to have a time of prayer together. And as uh, Sean mentioned earlier, uh, Dave, I called this morning, and Dave is sick, and Pastor Larry is sick. Uh, so let's lift both of them up. 
and also want to lift up, like I said, the ladies who are on ladies' retreat. But are there others that have a prayer request or a praise they'd like lifted up this morning? Praise something God has done or a prayer request we can pray about? So Deborah's friend Diane, who just recovered from COVID, now has double pneumonia, and her husband is sick as well. Anybody else this morning? All right. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Dearly Father, we do thank you this morning that we were able to come before you in a time of prayer. Lord, we thank you that you are a good father to us, a loving father, a loving God. Father, we thank you that today we can gather together and just be able to worship you this morning, to praise you. Lord, that as we start the service with worship, we also begin our time of prayer by praising you, for recognizing the love you pour into our life, the grace you pour into our life. Father, we just thank you that you are so close to us, and Lord, that you want to hear from us as your children. Father, we thank you for the privilege of prayer that we can just pour out our hearts before you. Not just me up here, but each of us uh, in our own seats praying to you and lifting up things that are on our hearts. So Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness and your mercy is new to us each day. Father, this morning we do have things in our hearts that we want to lift up before you. Father, this morning we begin and we, we lift up ladies' retreat the last few days and as they finish up this morning, Father, that you will be with them. Lord, we pray that it was a, a blessed time for the ladies that were able to be there, for the speaker and the messages that they heard, for the fellowship of the women in our church and the fellowship of the women in our district. Father, we just pray for this time that you will continue to use it this morning as they gather and worship the ones that are still there, that you'll use that time to just draw them closer to you, to help them to hear your voice. Pray for those that have already come back, that you would just use the, the message of what they've heard to encourage them. Father, we just thank you for this great ministry that happens and just pray that it will continue to encourage the, the women of this church in wonderful ways. And Father, this morning we lift up Pastor Larry to you. We pray for him, Father, that you will have your hand upon him. Father, as he has been sick all this week, Father, that you will just strengthen him and bring healing. Lord, as he has been so faithful to pray for, for all of us so many times, Lord, we now lift him up that you will hear our prayers and, and just bring your healing upon him. Father, we pray even now as, as we, his church family, Lord, that as we lift him up, that he would feel your healing power upon him. So we just ask for your touch upon Pastor Larry this morning. And Lord, we lift up Dave to you as well. Father, we pray for Dave, that you will bring healing to him. The Lord, that he will just feel your healing touch upon him as a great physician. That he will quickly recover this morning, Lord, and just feel your miraculous touch upon him. So Father, we lift up these two of men to you, Pastor Larry and Dave, and pray for your healing upon them. And Father, we pray for a wretched friend, Diane. And Lord, we pray that you will be with Diane. As Lord, you brought her through COVID, we now pray that you will heal her of this double pneumonia, that you will just heal her lungs, Lord, touch her, give her strength and your healing. Father, be with her and her husband, Lord, and help the both of them, that they will make a quick and full recovery, Father. Please ask for your healing touch upon them. And Lord, this morning, we continue to lift up our country. Father, that you will bring our country together, that you will reunite it, that you will bring reconciliation. Lord, that you will bring with our, be with our leaders, give them wisdom and direction. Father, may we as your people be faithful to, to lift our country up in prayer, to lift our leaders up in prayer. Father, we just pray for a great healing over our nation as well as a great awakening over our nation. Lord, that people everywhere will turn to you and know that their hope is found in you. Father, this morning as we gather in this service, we pray that you will just help us to understand your word as we look at it in a few minutes. Lord, help us more than hearing, hearing my voice, Lord, that we will hear from you and what you want to say to us. So Father, we just pray for the message and the sermon this morning, that you will be in the midst of that. Father, we thank you again that we're able to gather together in prayer. We lift up all these prayer requests, as well as those that are on our hearts this morning. We just lift them up to you. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for how you are working in our, in our prayers, Father. 
And we pray all this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his wonderful name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to ask the praise team to come back up to lead us in worship. <laughs> Thank you. 
were told to me was that you had to be ready to preach, print, sing, or pray at the drop of the hat. <laughs> well, this morning we dropped the hat to Dick, so I didn't want to throw him under the bus with all of our new songs that we played, so I figured I'd share with him. We're going to do two hymns today. One of them was the one we just did, and then we're going to do, um, just a minute. And I'm telling you all of this because the guys upstairs are going to need to know. <laughs> So and then we're going to do a mansion over a hilltop, which is going to be 471. But before we do that, we're going to do um, Blessed Be the Rock. I think. Just a minute. Thank you. 
Would you join me in giving a hand to Aaron, Richard, and Sean this morning for their moment's <laughs> notice filling in? Appreciate it, guys. So if you want to grab a Bible and turn to Philippians, Philippians chapter 4, we're going to look at four verses this morning. Philippians chapter 4, we're going to look at verses 6 through 9 together. And in these verses, at least three of them are, are pretty famous verses that many of you will have heard before as we want to look at them. Philippians chapter 4, 6 through 9. And as we go through them, I want you to be thinking about what they're, you know, how, what the, the practical application if we lived out these four verses is. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 9. Let's hear God's word together. The Apostle Paul writes, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, Meditate on these things. The things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the peace of God will be with you. That God will bless us as we look at it this morning. Well, I don't know how often you look inside the bulletin, but if you do look inside the bulletin, in there there's the hymns listed that we were gonna we were gonna sing for second service. And we even got to sing some of them in first service. But if you were to look at them, you'd see that they're pretty well-known hymns, right? They're hymns that, that are pretty popular, well-known. The Old Rugged Cross, Shall We Gather at the River, my favorite, the one we sang in first service, How Great Thou Art, and of course the classic, Amazing Grace. And for the last probably eight or nine years, I, I selected the hymns that we, we sing at the 1030 service. And mostly I picked the ones that I remember, right? The ones I remember as a kid that we used to sing in church, or the the ones that my dad would play as we were growing up, or just the ones that, that I like. But there are a lot of great hymns in Christianity. Right? If you were to go through that, that hymnal, that red book, uh, our hymnal is full of hymns. I think there's over 600 there, and there's many I'm completely not familiar with, so, so I never picked those ones. But I came across a, a post this week, you know, talking about these great hymns, the great theology and the hymns that can stir our hearts. But this post read this week, Sometimes singing hymns can be convicting. And so the author modified humorously some hymn titles that he felt updated them to the current consumer church mentality. And he wrote this, here are some hymns that you can sing without a tinge of guilt. He said, you can sing the hymn, I Surrender Some. There shall be sprinkles of blessings. Onward Christian spectators. Where he leads me, I will consider following. Oh, how I like Jesus, just as I pretend to be. I love to talk about telling the story. Sweet minute of prayer, and, and my favorite, let me have my own way, Lord. <laughs> but we talk a lot about in this church what it means to, to truly follow Jesus. Right? Well, what does it mean to, to truly follow Jesus? And we're, we're constantly being warned about kind of this idea of kind of easy believism, uh, cheap grace, right? What well, we can see so much prevalent in our country, right? Just kind of church consumer mentality. I come to church to see what I can get out of it, and if it convicts me or if it makes me feel guilty at all, I'll just, I'll just go to another church or I, I won't go to church at all. How many of you ever heard the quote, religion is the opiate of the masses? Right? Anybody know who wrote that? Karl Marx. Karl Marx, right? Good old Karl Marx. And right after he wrote that, he stated this, the abolishment of religion as the illusionary happiness of people is required for real happiness. The abolishment of religion as the illusionary happiness of the people is required for their real happiness. Karl Marx wrote that religion was just based on an illusion that offered a, a false hope to the poor and oppressed. It might make people feel better about a situation, right? It might dull the pain like taking opium would, but it did not fix the real problems of life. It was kind of like a, a false facade that covered real life. 
You know, sometimes people ask, well, what makes, the, what makes any real difference in someone's life when they, they follow Jesus? Right? And sometimes we see this in church. Somebody, somebody comes, they get saved, they come to church, and they get all excited. Right? They start reading their Bible, they start attending house churches, and they're, they're all excited. And you see their life has suddenly changed because they found Jesus. Right? There's a, a real transformation. Their heart has changed. They're all, they're all excited about the things of God. And yet other times we can see people that go to church for, for years and years and years, and yet it doesn't ever seem to really penetrate in their heart. It doesn't ever really seem to, to cause a whole lot of transformation. We can see churchgoers that still exhibit very little grace. We can see people that go to church for years and years, and yet we, they don't seem to have any more love or, or joy or peace than a non-believer. And you can wonder, even though they, they sit in church every week, is there a disconnect, right? Do they truly believe what we, we sing about the songs or, or the prayers or what's taught? There's a story told by Pastor Doctor, uh, Dr. Paul Chappelle. And he says that sometime a year ago, sometime a while ago, an 18-year-old girl from Washington State attended a, a church, a, a worship service at a local church. For the first time in her life, she goes into this church and she hears the gospel message. And the following Tuesday, the members of the church received a letter from her. It read this, Dear church members, last Sunday I attended your church and I heard the preacher. In the sermon, the preacher said, All men have sinned and rebelled against God, and because of their rebellion and disobedience, they all face eternal condemnation and separation from God. But then he also said God loves man and sent his son Jesus Christ in the world to redeem men from their sins and that all those who believe in him would go to heaven and live with God eternally. My parents recently died in rapid succession. I know they did not believe in Jesus Christ whom you call the Savior of the world. If what you believe is true, they are eternally condemned in hell. You compel me to believe that either this message of yours is true and you do not believe the message or you don't care. You see, we live only three blocks from your church and no one ever told us. And the story begs the question, if all this is true, right? if all we ever talk about on Sunday mornings and we hear this message about a Savior, if it's all true, what is it going to, how is it going to impact us? What are we going to do about it? How should it transform us? What should the church look like Monday through Saturday? In Philippians 1.25, Paul writes that we should all be progressing in the faith, right? That we should all have this joy in our faith. And today in these few verses in Philippians 4, I see Paul talking about real, tangible ways of what it means to follow Jesus. And when you look through those four verses, as we're going to do in a minute, what I like about it is it isn't a list of don't do this. Right? We've all been to church at some time, and we've all heard someone, a pastor or a Sunday school teacher or something, give us a list of what we shouldn't do. Right? Don't do this. Don't do that. Stop doing this. But Paul doesn't say that. Right? He doesn't say, you know, give up drinking and stop committing adultery. I think what's much more powerfully, he brings up the things that we can begin to do today or spur on this process of transformation. Right? It isn't a list of negatives. Stop that. It's a positive standpoint. Here's what you should start doing. And another beautiful aspect of it is that it speaks to everyone. Right? It should speak to you even if you've been a Christian for decades. As you go through these four verses, it, it speaks to us. And, and Paul is also speaking to you if this is your, you know, your brand new in the spiritual journey. They're very practical and sequential. Beginning things that we can begin to practice today. It starts with something that you can do today and build on. And I don't know about you, but sometimes we can get so lost in theology and, and the deep things that we miss the application. So a funny story told about the little sisters of the poor that were going from door to door in this French city and they were collecting money for the elderly and so they go to door, knock and ask for donations and this, this one nun is off by herself and she knocks on the door of this, this rich man who was kind of a, a free thinker in the city. And he said he would give a thousand francs, which was a, a ton of money back then, but he said there was a catch. He said, I'll give you a thousand francs if you, nun, will have a glass of champagne with me. 
It was an embarrassing situation for the nun, right? She hesitated, and but her hesitation was short. After all, she said a thousand francs would meant a lot of loaves of bread, and they could really help a lot of poor people. So the nun agrees, and a servant brings out a bottle of champagne. He, he pours a glass for her, and the brave little nun empties the glass and said, Now, sir, another glass, please, at the same price. <laughs> well, I want us to look at these four verses. And I want you to go through them with me. And as we said, in Philippians 4, it's Paul giving us this final message to this church that he loves. He wants them to know, right? I've gone through this life transformation. I met Jesus there on the road to Damascus. It completely changed me. From who I was, everything in my heart, it has changed me. And I want you to experience that same transformation. Warren Worsby calls this section of scripture, Philippians 4, 6 through 9, he says it is right praying, right thinking, and right living. Right praying, right thinking, and right living. And that's what I want us to think about for the next few minutes. And we begin with verses 6 and 7. Look at them with me. He says, be anxious for nothing. Right? That might be the hardest part of the whole scripture, else, right? <laughs> Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Right, Philippians 4, 6, and 7 is, is these awesome verses, right? And he says the first tangible thing you can do to be transformed by Jesus is right praying. Right, he says we need to learn how to talk to God. And I wish that I had learned this, or I wish that I had devoted myself to this earlier in life, right? Just this awesome power and, and privilege and sacredness of talking to God, right? We shouldn't be surprised, but our whole walk with Jesus begins by talking with Him. And, and there's a truth in Christianity that you will never raise higher than your prayer life, right? Your spiritual walk will never get higher than your prayer life. And think about how he starts verse 16. He says, be anxious for nothing. Anybody been anxious about anything lately? Right? If you're honest, how many of you feel like you've worried more over this last year than you worried in previous years? Arthur Summers Roche wrote this, anxiety is a thin stream of fear trickling through the mind. If encouraged, it cuts a channel into which all other thoughts are drained. Now, I don't think it's a coincidence that Paul begins by talking about this message about telling people not to worry. Right? People tend to worry. But the question is, as people who, who are here and you know that there's a living God, you know there's a loving God, should there be something different about us when we see the problems of life? George Mueller's great quote says, The beginning of anxiety is the end of faith, and the beginning of true faith is the end of anxiety. Well, we all know that classic saying, right? Like, nature abhors a vacuum. So if we're going to remove worry and anxiety from our lives, what are we supposed to fill it with? Well, Paul says, fill it with prayer. Replace your worry with prayer. And look at how Paul writes this verse, Philippians 4, 6. He doesn't just say pray, right? Pray, God bless you, get out. Right? He, he says, let me, let me give you a more expanded picture of what a full prayer life is. I think every Christian in church knows that we should pray. But what does that look like? What does it look like to pray? So if you look at verse 6, look in there. He has three different words for how to pray. Right, you see those in there? Prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. So let's think about that. The first one is prayer. Someone wrote the word prayer is a general word for making requests known to the Lord. But it carries this idea of adoration, devotion, and worship. Whenever we find ourselves worrying, our first action ought to be to get along with God and worship Him. Adoration is what is needed. We must see the greatness and majesty of God. We must realize that He is big enough to solve our problems. Right? Someone said it's very hard to worry and praise God at the exact same time. You know, if you want a picture of this, the first idea is, right, coming into God's presence. It's talking with God. It's having a conversation. It's having a dialogue with God. I thought, how often do we have conversations with God and we kind of come to God like a, like a spoiled child, right? 
God, I, I want you to drive me to the mall. I want you to give me $90 for the sneakers that I need. Then I want pizza when I get home for dinner. Thank you. Goodbye. Right? And sometimes that's how we have conversations with God. Here's exactly what I want. I don't really want to hear anything from you. Here's what I want. And then we hang up on it. Now, there are times, right, when maybe that's more appropriate, right? There's times when I can think of my kids growing up and they would, they would run into the house with a scraped knee or something and they're hurting and, and you just want to find out what's wrong with them, how they got hurt, how you can help them. But that's all built on a relationship with them, right? When's the last time you had a, a conversation with God? Right, where you spoke and, and you gave him a chance to speak back to you, to say something, listen for God. There are times when we come to God in need, right? That's the, the second word he uses there, supplications. Our, our wants and needs, right? Jesus taught his disciples to pray, right? Our Lord, give us our daily bread. Right? That's appropriate. It speaks about this earnest sharing of our needs and problems, right? God loves you. God cares about you. He wants to hear from you, right? There, he's there to help you. We should never be afraid to run to him with our, our needs and problems. Right? We pray in faith. We pray in confidence. We pray in the the character of God, that God is love. And then he writes, we need to conclude our prayers with what? Thanksgiving. Right? You can think about it when Jesus heals those ten lepers in John 17, right? He, he heals ten people, and nine of them just walk off. They never say thank you, but the one comes back and he says thank you to Jesus. And in Luke 17, 17 through 18, so Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not found any who returned to give glory to God except for this form? And, and so there needs to be thanksgiving in our prayer life. So you have prayers, you have supplications, and you have thanksgiving. And here's the challenge, right? The, the practical application is think about your own prayer life. If you had one of those pie charts, right, from back in school, and you were to divide it into those three categories of, of prayer, worship, supplication, and thanksgiving, what would your pie chart look like? Right? How big a space would you have to Thanksgiving? How big a space would you have to, to just talking to God, worshiping God? Right? And my challenge to you is, if you look at that pie chart and you're like, man, the truth is that 95% of my prayer life is me just asking God for stuff. My challenge to think about is, is let's try evening that out a little bit. Finding some balance between praise and supplication and Thanksgiving. But what's the power of prayer? Well, if you look at verse 6, it doesn't end with a period. It continues into verse 7. Right? He gives us this, this encouragement to pray, but then he continues in verse 7. He says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Right? If you, if you say you have worry in your life, how many of you would like more peace in your lives? Right? And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The truth is, as we pray more, it will bring us peace. Pastor Marvin Vincent wrote, Peace is the fruit of believing prayer. prayer. And, and here's what I want you to consider, right? Here Paul says that you can have a peace that passes all understanding. Uh, on Wednesday night, Pastor Larry's talked about from Ephesians 3.19, Paul writes, that you would know the love of Christ which passes all understanding. But here's what strikes me. What does it mean to have something that passes knowledge, right? How is it that you can know something better than knowing? What's well, by experience? Right? I, I can tell you that God can give you peace, and, and some of you know this. He can give you a peace in the midst of your greatest trials, in the midst of your greatest storms. I can tell you that. You can hear a sermon on it. But it isn't until you experience it that you'll just stand in amazement to feel the peace that God can give you. And it's not a hollow peace. It's not a ignorant, head-in-the-sand kind of peace or a peace born out of apathy. No, it's a peace of God. It says, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. William Barclay, in his book, Prodigals and Those Who Love, he writes this, When we pray, remember, first... The love of God that wants the best for us. Two, the wisdom of God that knows what is best for us. And three, the power of God that can accomplish it. Warren Warsby wrote, The first condition for a secure mind and victory over worrying is right praying. 
And he says, right praying will then lead to right thinking. Right? And look at verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. You know, the, the peace that he spoke about in the, the verse before involved our heart and mind. Isaiah 26, 2 says, You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. Right? Paul says something here that is so important, I think especially important for us where we find ourselves in 2021. He says, Be careful what you are feeding your mind. And I was thinking this week that we have access to everything in a moment's notice, don't we? Right? You can, you can watch for four hours today cat videos if you want to. Right? You can watch TikTok videos for four hours. Right? right now in church, you can be checking a sports score and watching squirrels surfing, whatever you want to do, right? right? At the touch of your phone, you can watch the most depraved movies or you can watch the most disgusting videos. Right? You can watch anything you want at the hit of one button. You can go home and watch TV and worry. You can scroll through your phone and worry. But Paul says, guard your minds. Guard your thought life. 2 Corinthians 10.5, the Bible tells us, bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. That's a lot harder than trying to not do this or not do that. It says bring your thought life into captivity. There's an old adage that says this, sow a thought, reap an action, Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. But he, he goes through our thought life here. He says, whatever's true. I wrote out here, egads, which my spell check says is not a real word, egads. But I wrote egads, but how much of what we consume today isn't even true? Right? How much of what we think about and we watch and we scroll through isn't even true stuff anymore, right? And, and we feed that into our minds and it's not even true. He says, whatever is true. The, the sad thing is that so many people right now are feeding their life on misinformation. Well, it's on Facebook. Well, it's on TikTok. Certainly it must be true. Right, and that leads us to worry. I was doing, reading a, a study this week for the sermon that says only 8% of what people actually worry about is actually true. Only 8% of what people worry about is actually true. 92% of what people worry about they found was either imaginary, never happened, or over things that people had no control over anyhow. Right, what does the Bible describe Satan as? It says Satan is a liar. Satan is a liar and the father of all lies, right? Listen to this awesome quote. It says, worry is fear's extravagance. It extracts interest on troubles before it comes due. It constantly drains the energy God gives us to face daily problems and to fulfill many responsibilities. It is therefore a sinful waste. A woman who had lived long enough to have learned some of the important truths about life remarked, I have had a lot of troubles in my life, most of which never happened. She had worried about many things that had never occurred and had come to see the total futility of her anxiety. Right? Paul, after that, he says, whatever things are noble and just, right? Whatever is worthy of respect and right, right? Taking control of our minds. Do not focus our attention on things that are dishonorable and permit them to have control over our thoughts. Right? Noble in the Greek means grave, not foolish. Just means righteous. And just think about your, your thought life compared to the end of this verse, right? Whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, he says meditate on these things. Right? This section calls us to examine our, our thought. Right? Isn't that what Jesus concentrated on, right? It says the, 
The man who has lusted after a woman has committed adultery in his heart, right? If you hate your brother without cause, you are, you know, in danger. Right? It says, take the thoughts of your heart captive. Proverbs 23, 7 says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Right? This is real practical. What kind of things are bouncing around in your mind throughout the week? What are you feeding your mind and your heart? And, and try holding this passage up as a, a standard against your thought. And again, this is something every one of us can begin to do today. Or as we wrote, it will motivate us to do better. Don't waste your mind power on things that will tear yourself down. So he goes through, he says, all right, dude, you got to pray right, then you got to think right. That will lead to, to right thinking. And he says that will eventually bring you to right living. Right? Verse 9, the shortest verse in this section, is actually about right living. He says, the things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the peace of God will be with you. Right living. Right? And it's important. We can't, we can't separate our outward actions from our inward attitudes. But as you read that verse and you look at verse 9, uh, again, it's all tied up with the supernatural peace that God offers us. Right? Paul encourages these believers, do these things. Right? Live truly for God. Right? Praying, right thinking, right living. But I think about this. See, in the church, we often try to do those three things in the exact opposite order, don't we? Right? And maybe that's how you were taught. Maybe that's how you grew up, right? First, I'm going to focus on how I live. Then I'll start working on my mind. And then I'll get prayer if I ever get to that point. Right? And so in the church, we often teach them in the exact opposite order that Paul gives them in Philippians, right? A new person comes to the church, and we start right away with right living. Right? You better change your actions. Right? We need you to stop swearing. We need you to stop smoking. We need you to stop doing whatever. But Philippians has the opposite order, right? What if we started by teaching someone how to pray on day one? Talking to God. What if we then help them through their thought life and the things that they started putting in their hearts? Do you suppose that that would help them to lead a life more pleasing to Christ? The Apostle Paul in these four verses revolutionizes how a majority of churches operate. Right? He would say, first thing you need to do is teach them to talk to God. Teach them how to have a conversation with God. Teach them how to, how to be in a dialogue with God. Then he would say, let's teach them to have their, their minds captive. Right? And, and he says, then the actions will follow. Now, every week in the house churches, we end with the same three questions. And if you go to a house church, you probably have them all memorized. Right? What is God saying to you? What are you going to do about it? And how can we help you? Well, as I close the message this morning, I speak those same three questions to all of us. Right? In these four verses, what is God saying to you? What are you going to do about it? And how, as we as a church, can we come alongside of you? Right? If you want to be transformed by Jesus, how will I take these truths and apply them to my life this week? Let's bow in prayer together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the truths found in your word. Father, so simple things from these four verses, yet so profound to impact our lives for transformation. Lord, so often we get caught up and we want to share Christianity and we see someone doing something that we think is not the right thing and so we try to get them to stop that, but maybe we never even introduce them to you and have you work in their hearts. Maybe there's people here today that are like, man, I, I'm really battling this sin, and I've been fighting this sin for years, and, and, and it's just beating me up. Lord, I, I pray that they would learn this morning to first talk to you about it. To come into your presence and say, God, I, I know I'm not perfect, but I need your help. And Lord, help us to begin with right praying. Something all of us can do. We don't need to be pastors or missionaries. We just need to talk to you. And then, Lord, help us to think about our thought life. What are the things that we are constantly putting into our mind and heart? 
How much time are we just wasting staring at our phones? What kind of garbage is being fed into our minds? Is it true? Is it noble? Is it just? And Father, as we get right praying and right thinking, Lord, I, I fully believe you will help us with right living. So Father, I pray that you just take these simple truths found in this word and help us as we go out from here, not to, not to put them off, but to put them into practice today. Lord, help us to come around each other, to help each other, that we are in this journey together. Father, we thank you for the truth found here. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that speaks to us. And we pray this in Christ's mighty name. Amen. Amen. Will you stand with me as we close in worship together? So, um, on top of what Pastor Eric is saying, one of the things that Lydia and I are going to do after we leave church today is we're going to go to house church. And we're going to talk about what an awesome sermon that we just heard. But I'm going to give you some uh, real-time, this week examples of this awesome sermon. So, uh, when I was in high school, you would never catch me up there. You would never catch me talking to people. I used to take F's in public speaking because I wouldn't get up and turn on. This is true to just God. So it's God that works through uh, me so that we can worship together. Uh, one of the other things that happened this week, as Pastor Eric was just talking about, Claire picks the songs. So we come to practice, we come to um, worship when we start singing, and Claire already has everything all planned out for us. So far, we've done one song that Claire has planned, and that's not because of me. It's because, as Pastor Eric is saying, you pray, you listen, and you do what God tells you to. And one of the things that would have happened this morning when I looked at my phone, and Pastor Eric's one text, and Dave is another text, and they say, oh, by the way, you're going to be all by yourself with Aaron this morning. Uh, the first thing I thought of was, okay, I'm going to go to my prayer closet. Of course, you never get up. Oh, I'm going to wait until God speaks to me like, verbally so that then I'm going to do something. No, God doesn't speak to us always verbally. God sometimes speaks to us through what it is that we want to do, what it is that we do, what it is that we decide, how it is that we act. And a lot of times we want to do something, and God says, no, do this. So we just need to have the... Um, be brave enough to follow what God wants us to do. And this morning, the last song that we're going to sing is not on the list, but we're going to talk about how good our Father is with a good, good Father.